Hello friends, I welcome you to this second installment in a calm reading of A Little Princess. Tonight I will be reading for you chapters 3, Ermengarde, and 4, Lutty. If you enjoy the narration of this book, I would encourage you to subscribe if you have not done so already and click the bell icon so that you will be notified when the next chapter is available. Let's find a calm and comfortable place where you can safely relax. And let us begin these chapters. 3. Ermengarde On that first morning, when Sarah sat at Miss Minchin's side, aware that the whole schoolroom was devoting itself to observing her, she had noticed very soon one little girl, about her own age, who looked at her very hard, with a pair of light, rather dull blue eyes. She was a fat child, who did not look as if she were in the least clever but she had a good-naturedly pouting mouth. Her flaxen hair was braided in a tight pigtail, tied with a ribbon, and she had pulled this pigtail around her neck and was biting the end of the ribbon, resting her elbows on the desk as she stared wonderingly at the new pupil. When Monsieur Dufarge began to speak to Sarah, she looked a little frightened, and when Sarah stepped forward and, looking at him with the innocent, appealing eyes, answered him, without any warning in French, the fat little girl gave a startled jump, and grew quite red in her odd amazement. Having wept hopeless tears for weeks in the efforts to remember that La mère meant the mother, and le père the father. When one spoke sensible English, it was almost too much for her, suddenly, to find herself listening to a child her own age, who seemed not only quite familiar with these words, but apparently knew any number of others, and could mix them up with verbs as if they were mere trifles. She stared so hard and bit her ribbon on her pigtail so fast that she attracted the attention of Miss Minchin, who, feeling extremely cross at the moment, immediately pounced upon her. Miss St. John, she exclaimed severely, what do you mean by such conduct? Remove your elbows, take your ribbon out of your mouth, sit up at once. Upon which Miss St. John gave another jump, and when Lavinia and Chessie tittered, she became redder than ever. So red, indeed, that she almost looked as if tears were coming into her poor, dull, childish eyes. And Sarah saw her and was so sorry for her that she began rather to like her and want to be her friend. It was a way of hers always to want to spring into any fray in which someone was made uncomfortable or unhappy. If Sarah had been a boy and lived a few centuries ago, her father used to say, she would have gone about the country with her sword drawn, rescuing and defending everyone in distress. She always wants to fight when she sees people in trouble. So she took rather a fancy to fat, slow little Miss St. John, and kept glancing toward her through the morning. She saw that lessons were not easy matter to her, and that there was no danger of her ever being spoiled by being treated as a show pupil. Her French lesson was a pathetic thing. Her pronunciation made even Monsieur Dufarge smile in spite of himself and Lavinia and Chessie and the more fortunate girls either giggled or looked at her in wondering disdain. 
but Sarah did not laugh. She tried to look as if she did not hear when Miss St. John called Le Bon Pain, Li Bon Pang. She had a fine, hot little temper of her own, and it made her feel rather savage when she heard the titters and saw the poor, stupid, distressed child's face. It isn't funny, really, she said between her teeth, as she bent over her book. They ought not to laugh. When lessons were over, and the pupils gathered together in groups to talk, Sarah looked for Miss St. John, and finding her bundled rather disconsolately in a window seat, she walked over to her and spoke. She only said the kind of thing little girls always say to each other by way of beginning an acquaintance. But there was something friendly about Sarah, and people always felt it. What is your name? she said. To explain Miss John's amazement, one must recall that a new pupil is, for a short time, a somewhat uncertain thing. And of this new pupil, the entire school had talked the night before, until it fell asleep, quite exhausted, by excitement and contradictory stories. A new pupil with a carriage and a pony and a mate, and a voyage from India to discuss, was not an ordinary acquaintance. My name's Ermengarde St. John, she answered. Mine is Sarah Crewe, said Sarah. Yours is very pretty. It sounds like a storybook. Do you like it? fluttered Ermengarde. I, I like yours. Miss St. John's chief trouble in life was that she had a clever father. Sometimes this seemed to her a dreadful calamity. If you have a father who knows everything, who speaks seven or eight languages, and has thousands of volumes which he has apparently learned by heart, he frequently expects you to be familiar with the contents of your lesson books, at least, and it is not improbable that he will feel you ought to be able to remember a few incidents of history and to write a French exercise. Ermengarde was a severe trial to Mr. St. John. He could not understand how a child of his could be a notably and unmistakably dull creature who never shone in anything. Good heavens, he had said more than once as he stared at her. There are times when I think she is as stupid as her Aunt Eliza. If her Aunt Eliza had been slow to learn and quick to forget a thing entirely when she had learned it, Ermengarde was strikingly like her. She was the monumental dunce of the school, and it could not be denied. She must be made to learn, her father said to Miss Minchin. Consequently, Ermengarde spent the greater part of her life in disgrace or in tears. She learned things and forgot them, or if she remembered them, she did not understand them. So it was natural that, having made Sarah's acquaintance, she should sit and stare at her with profound admiration. You can speak French, can't you? she said respectfully. Sarah got onto the window seat, which was a big, deep one, and, tucking up her feet, sat with her hands clasped round her knees. I can speak it because I have heard it all my life, she answered. You could speak it if you had always heard it. Oh, no, I couldn't, said Armagard. I never could speak it. Why? inquired Sarah curiously. Armagard shook her head so that the pigtail wobbled. You heard me just now, she said. I'm always like that. I can't say the words. They're so queer. She paused a moment and then added with a touch of awe in her voice, You are clever, aren't you? 
Sarah looked out of the window into the dingy square, where the sparrows were hopping and twittering on the wet iron railings and the sooty branches of the trees. She reflected a few moments. She had heard it said very often that she was clever, and she wondered if she was, and if she was, how it happened. I don't know, she said. I can't tell. Then, seeing a mournful look on the round, chubby face, she gave a little laugh and changed the subject. Would you like to see Emily? she inquired. Who is Emily? Ermengarde asked, just as Miss Minchin had done. Come up to my room and see, said Sarah, holding out her hand. They jumped down from the window seat together and went upstairs. Is it true? Ermengarde whispered as they went through the hall. Is it true that you have a playroom all to yourself? Yes, Sarah answered. Papa asked Miss Minchin to let me have one because, well, it was because when I play I make up stories and tell them to myself. And I don't like people to hear me. It spoils it if I think people listen. They had reached the passage leading to Sarah's room by this time, and Ermengarde stopped short, staring and quite losing her breath. You make up stories, she gasped. Can you do that, as well as speak French? Can you? Sarah looked at her in simple surprise. Why, anyone can make up things, she said. Have you never tried? She put her hand warningly on Ermengarde's. Let us go very quietly to the door, she whispered. And then I will open it quite suddenly. Perhaps we may catch her. She was half laughing, but there was a touch of mysterious hope in her eyes, which fascinated Ermengarde. Though she had not the remotest idea what it meant, or whom it was she wanted to catch, or why she wanted to catch her. Whatsoever she meant, Ermengarde was sure it was something delightfully exciting. So, quite thrilled with expectation, she followed her on tiptoe along the passage. They made not the least noise until they reached the door. Then Sarah suddenly turned the handle and threw it wide open. Its opening revealed the room quite neat and quiet. A fire gently burning in the grate. And a wonderful doll sitting in a chair by it, apparently reading a book. Oh, she got back to her seat before we could see her, Sarah explained. Of course, they always do. They are as quick as lightning. Ermengarde looked from her to the doll and back again. Can she walk? she asked breathlessly. Yes, answered Sarah. At least I believe she can. At least I pretend I believe she can. And that makes it seem as if it were true. Have you never pretended things? No, said Ermengarde. Never. I... tell me about it. She was so bewitched by this odd, new companion that she actually stared at Sarah instead of Emily. Notwithstanding that Emily was the most attractive doll person she had ever seen. Let us sit down, said Sarah, and I will tell you. It's so easy that when you begin you can't stop. You just go on and on, doing it always. And it's beautiful. Emily, you must listen. This is Ermengarde St. John, Emily. Ermengarde, this is Emily. Would you like to hold her? Oh, may I? said Ermengarde. May I really? She is beautiful. And Emily was put into her arms. Never in her dull, short life had Miss St. John dreamed of such an hour 
as the one she spent with the queer new pupil, before they heard the lunch bell ring and were obliged to go downstairs. Sarah sat upon the hearth rug and told her strange things. She sat rather huddled up, and her green eyes shone, and her cheeks flushed. She told stories of the voyage and stories of India, but what fascinated Ermengarde the most was a fancy about the dolls who walked and talked, and who could do anything they chose when the human beings were out of the room, but who must keep the powers a secret, and so flew back to their places like lightning when people returned to the room. We couldn't do it, said Sarah seriously. You see, it's a kind of magic. Once, when she was relating the story of the search for Emily, Ermengarde saw her face suddenly change. A cloud seemed to pass over it and put out the light in her shining eyes. She drew her breath in so sharply that it made a funny, sad little sound. And then she shut her lips and held them tightly closed, as if she was determined either to do or not to do something. Ermengarde had an idea that if she had been like any other little girl, she might have suddenly burst out sobbing and crying. But she did not. Have you... have you a... a pain? Ermengarde ventured. Yes, Sarah answered, after a moment's silence. But it is not in my body. Then she added something in a low voice, which she tried to keep quite steady. And it was this. Do you love your father more than anything else in all the whole world? Ermengarde's mouth fell open a little. She knew that it would be far from behaving like a respectable child at a select seminary to say that it had never occurred to you that you could love your father, and that you would do anything desperate to avoid being left alone in his society for ten minutes. She was, indeed, greatly embarrassed. I... I scarcely ever see him, she stammered. He's always in the library, reading things. I love mine more than all the world ten times over, Sarah said. That is what my pain is. He has gone away. She put her head quietly down on her little huddled-up knees and sat very still for a few minutes. She's going to cry out loud thought Ermengarde fearfully. But she did not. Her short black locks tumbled about her ears, and she sat still. Then she spoke without lifting her head. I promised him I would bear it, she said, and I will. You have to bear things. Think what soldiers bear. Papa is a soldier. If there was a war, he would have to bear marching, and thirstiness, and perhaps deep wounds. And he would never say a word, not one word. Ermengarde could only gaze at her, but she felt that she was beginning to adore her. She was so wonderful and different from anyone else. Presently, she lifted her face and shook back her black locks with a queer little smile. If I go on talking and talking, she said, and telling you things about pretending, I shall bear it better. You don't forget, but you bear it better. Ermengarde did not know why a lump came into her throat, and her eyes felt as if tears were in them. Lavinia and Jesse are best friends, she said rather huskily. I wish we could be best friends. Would you have me for yours? You're clever, and I'm the stupidest child in the school. But, but I, oh, I do so like you. 
I'm glad of that, said Sarah. It makes you thankful when you are liked. Yes, we will be friends. And I'll tell you what. A sudden gleam lightening her face. I can help you with your French lessons. 4. Plotty If Sarah had been a different kind of child, the life she led at Miss Minchin's select seminary for the next few years would not have been at all good for her. She was treated more as if she were a distinguished guest at establishment than if she were a mere little girl. If she had been a self-opinionated, domineering child, she might have become disagreeable enough to be unbearable through being so much indulged and flattered. If she had been an indolent child, she would have learned nothing. Privately, Miss Minchin disliked her, but she was far too worldly a woman to do or say anything which might make such a desirable pupil wish to leave her school. She knew quite well that if Sarah wrote to her papa to tell him she was uncomfortable or unhappy, Captain Crewe would remove her at once. Miss Minchin's opinion was that if a child were continually praised and never forbidden to do what she liked, she would be sure to be fond of the place where she was so treated. Accordingly, Sarah was praised for her quickness at her lessons, for her good manners, for the amiability to her fellow pupils, for her generosity if she gave sixpence to a beggar out of her full little purse. The simplest thing she did was treated as if it were a virtue. And if she had not had a disposition and a clever little brain, she might have been a very self-satisfied young person. But the clever little brain told her a great many sensible and true things about herself and her circumstances. And now and then she talked these things over to Ermengarde as time went on. Things happen to people by accident, she used to say. A lot of nice accidents have happened to me. It just happened that I always liked lessons and books, and could remember things when I learned them. It just happened that I was born with a father who was beautiful and nice and clever, and could give me everything I liked. Perhaps I have not really a good temper at all, but if you have everything you want and everyone is kind to you, how can you help but be good-tempered? I don't know, looking quite seriously, how I shall ever find out whether I'm really a nice child or a hard one. Perhaps I'm a hideous child, and no one will ever know, just because I never have any trials. Lavinia has no trials, said Ermengarde stolidly, and she is horrid enough. Sarah rubbed the end of her little nose reflectively, as she thought the matter over. Well, she said at last, perhaps that is because Lavinia is growing. This was a result of a charitable recollection of having heard Miss Amelia say that Lavinia was growing so fast that she believed it affected her health and temper. Lavinia, in fact, was spiteful. She was inordinately jealous of Sarah. Until the new pupil's arrival, she had felt herself the leader in the school. She had led because she was capable of making herself extremely disagreeable, if the others did not follow her. She domineered over the little children, and assumed grand airs with those big enough to be her companions. She was rather pretty, and had been the best-dressed pupil in the procession when the select seminary walked out two by two, until Sarah's velvet coats and sable muffs appeared, combined with the drooping ostrich feathers, and were led by Miss Minchin at the head of the line. This, at the beginning, had been bitter enough, but as time went on it became apparent that Sarah was a leader too and not because she could make herself disagreeable, but because she 
never did. And there's one thing about Sarah Crew. Jessie had enraged her best friend by saying honestly, she's never grand about herself the least bit. And you know she might be, Lavi. I believe I couldn't help being, just a little, if I had so many fine things and was made such a fuss over. It's disgusting the way Miss Minchin shows her off when parents come. Dear Sarah must come into the drawing room and talk to Mrs. Musgrave about India, mimicked Lavinia, in her most highly flavored imitation of Miss Minchin. Dear Sarah must speak French to Lady Pitkin. Her accent is so perfect. She didn't learn her French at the seminary at any rate, and there's nothing so clever in her knowing it. She says herself she didn't learn it at all. She just picked it up, because she always heard her papa speak it. And as to her papa, there is nothing so grand in being an Indian officer. Well, said Jessie slowly, he's killed tigers. He killed the one in the skin Sarah has in her room. That's why she likes it so. She lies on it and strokes its head and talks to it as if it was a cat. She's always doing something silly, snapped Lavinia. My mama says that way of hers of pretending things is silly. She says she will grow up eccentric. It was quite true that Sarah was never grand. She was a friendly little soul, and she had her privileges and belongings with a free hand. The little ones who were accustomed to being disdained and ordered out of the way by mature ladies aged ten and twelve were never made to cry by this most envied of them all. She was a motherly young person, and when people fell down and scraped their knees, she ran and helped them up and patted them, or found in her pocket a bonbon or some other article of soothing nature. She never pushed them out of her way, or alluded to their years as a humiliation, and a blot upon their small characters. If you are four, you are four, she said severely to Lavinia on an occasion of her having, it must be confessed, slapped Lottie and called her a brat. But you will be five next year, and six the year after that. And, opening large, convicting eyes, it takes sixteen years to make you twenty. Dear me, said Lavinia, how we can calculate. In fact, it was not to be denied that sixteen and four made twenty. And twenty was an age the most daring were scarcely bold enough to dream of. So the younger children adored Sarah. More than once she had been known to have a tea party made up of these despised ones in her own room, and Emily had been played with, and Emily's own tea service used, the one with cups, which held quite a lot of much sweetened weak tea, and had blue flowers on them. No one had seen such a very real doll's tea set before. From that afternoon, Sarah was regarded as a goddess and a queen by the entire alphabet class. Lottie Leck worshipped her to such an extent that if Sarah had been a motherly person, she would have found her tiresome. Lottie had been sent to school by a rather flighty young papa, who could not imagine what else to do with her. Her young mother had died, and as the child had been treated like a favorite doll, or a very spoiled pet monkey, or lapdog ever since the first hour of her life, she was a very appalling little creature. When she wanted anything, or did not want anything, she wept and howled. And as she always wanted the things she could not have, and did not want the things that were best for her, her shrill little voice was usually to be heard, uplifted in wails in one part of the house or another. Her strongest weapon was that, in some mysterious way, 
she had found out that a very small girl who had lost her mother was a person who ought to be pitied and made much of. She had probably heard some grown-up people talking her over in the early days, after her mother's death, so it became her habit to make great use of this knowledge. The first time Sarah took her in charge was one morning, when, on passing a sitting room, she heard both Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia trying to suppress the angry wails of some child, who evidently refused to be silent. She refused so strenuously, indeed, that Miss Minchin was obliged to almost shout, in a stately and severe manner, to make herself heard. What is she crying for? she almost yelled. Oh, 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 Sarah heard. I haven't got any mum, ma, ah. Oh, Lottie, screamed Miss Amelia. Do stop, darling. Don't cry. Please don't. Oh, 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 Lottie howled tempestuously. Haven't got any mum, ma, ah. She ought to be whipped, Miss Minchin proclaimed. You shall be whipped, you naughty child. Lottie wailed more loudly than ever. Miss Amelia began to cry. Miss Minchin's voice rose until it almost thundered. Then suddenly she sprang up from her chair in impotent indignation and flounced out of the room, leaving Miss Amelia to arrange the matter. She had paused in the hall, wondering if she ought to go into the room, because she had recently begun a friendly acquaintance with Lottie and might be able to quiet her. When Miss Minchin came out and saw her, she looked rather annoyed. She realized that her voice, as heard from inside the room, could not have sounded either dignified or amiable. Oh, Sarah! she exclaimed, endeavoring to produce a suitable smile. I stopped, exclaimed Sarah, because I knew it was Lottie, and I thought, perhaps, just perhaps, I could make her be quiet. May I try, Miss Minchin? If you can, you are a clever child, answered Miss Minchin, drawing in her mouth sharply. Then, seeing that Sarah looked slightly chilled by her asperity, she changed her manner. But you are clever in everything, she said, in her approving way. I dare say you can manage her. Go in. And she left her. When Sarah entered the room, Lottie was lying upon the floor, screaming and kicking her small fat legs violently. And Miss Amelia was bending over her in consternation and despair, looking quite red and damp with heat. Lottie had always found, when in her own nursery at home, that kicking and screaming would always be quieted by any means she insisted on. Poor plump Miss Amelia was trying first one method and then another. Poor darling, she said one moment. I know you haven't any mamma, poor. Then, in quite another tone, if you don't stop, Lottie, I will shake you, poor little angel. There. You wicked, bad, detestable child. I will smack you. I will. Sarah went to them quietly. She did not know at all what she was going to do. But she had a vague inward conviction that it would be better not to say such different kinds of things quite so helplessly and excitedly. Miss Amelia, she said in a low voice, Miss Minchin says I may try to make her stop. May I? Miss Amelia turned and looked at her hopelessly. Oh, do you think you can? she gasped. I don't know whether I can, answered Sarah still in her half-whisper. But I will try. Miss Amelia stumbled up from her knees with a heavy sigh and Lottie's fat legs kicked as hard as ever. If you will steal out of the room, 
said Sarah. I will stay with her. Oh, Sarah, almost whimpered Miss Amelia. We never had such a dreadful child before. I don't believe we can keep her. But she crept out of the room and was very much relieved to find an excuse for doing it. Sarah stood by the howling, furious child for a few moments and looked down at her without saying anything. Then she sat down flat on the floor beside her and waited. Except for Lottie's angry screams, the room was quite quiet. This was a new state of affairs for little Miss Legg, who was accustomed, when she screamed, to hear other people protest and implore and command and coax by turns. To lie and kick and shriek, and find the only person near you not seeming to mind in the least, attracted her attention. She opened her tight-shut screaming eyes to see who this person was. And it was only another little girl, but it was the one who owned Emily and all the nice things. And she was looking at her steadily, and as if she was merely thinking. Having paused for a few seconds to find this out, Lottie thought she must begin again, but the quiet of the room and of Sarah's odd, interested face made her first howl rather half-hearted. I haven't any ma, 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 ah, she announced, but her voice was not so strong. Sarah looked at her still more steadily but with a sort of understanding in her eyes. Neither have I, she said. This was so unexpected that it was astounding. Lottie actually dropped her legs, gave a wriggle, and lay and stared. A new idea will stop a crying child when nothing else will. Also, it was true that while Lottie disliked Miss Minchin, who was cross, and Miss Amelia, who was foolishly indulgent. She rather liked Sarah, little as she knew her. She did not want to give up her grievance, but her thoughts were distracted from it. So she wriggled again, and after a sulky sob, said, Where is she? Sarah paused a moment. Because she had been told that her mama was in heaven, she had thought a great deal about the matter and her thoughts had not been quite like those of other people. She went to heaven, she said, but I am sure she comes out sometimes to see me, though I don't see her. So does yours. Perhaps they can both see us now. Perhaps they are both in this room. Lottie sat bolt upright and looked about her. She was a pretty little curly-headed creature, and her round eyes were like wet forget-me-nots. If her mamma had seen her during the last half-hour, she might not have thought her the kind of child who ought to be related to an angel. Sarah went on talking. Perhaps some people might think that what she said was rather like a fairy story, but it was all so real to her own imagination that Lottie began to listen in spite of herself. She had been told that her mama had wings and a crown, and she had been shown pictures of ladies in beautiful white nightgowns, who were said to be angels. But Sarah seemed to be telling a real story about a lovely country, where real people were. There are fields and fields of flowers, she said, forgetting herself as usual when she began, and talking rather as if she were in a dream. Fields and fields of lilies, and when the soft wind blows over them, it wafts the scent of them into the air, and everybody always breathes it, because the soft wind is always blowing, and little children run about in the lily fields and gather armfuls of them, and laugh and make little wreaths, and the streets are shining, and people are never tired, however far they walk. 
They can float anywhere they like, and there are walls made of pearl and gold all round the city. But they are low enough for the people to go and lean on them, and look down onto the earth and smile, and send beautiful messages. Whatsoever story she had begun to tell, Lottie would, no doubt, have stopped crying, and been fascinated into listening. But there was no denying that this story was prettier than most others. She dragged herself close to Sarah, and drank in every word until the end came far too soon. When it did come, she was so sorry that she put up her lip ominously. I want to go there, she cried. I haven't any mama in this school. Sarah saw the danger signal and came out of her dream. She took hold of the chubby hand and pulled her close to her side with a coaxing little laugh. I will be your mama, she said. We will play that you are my little girl and Emily shall be your sister. Lottie's dimples all began to show themselves. Shall she? she said. Yes, answered Sarah, jumping to her feet. Let us go and tell her, and then I will wash your face and brush your hair. To which Lottie agreed quite cheerfully, and trotted out of the room and upstairs with her, without seeming even to remember that the whole of the last hour's tragedy had been caused by the fact that she had refused to be washed and brushed for lunch, and Miss Minchin had been called in to use her majestic authority. And from that time, Sarah was an adopted mother.